What I'd like to do over the course of the next um, 45 minutes or so is go on a journey to explore what our position within the cosmos really is. Um, and I'd like to start this expedition probably in a different place than many of you might be imagining. I'd like to start with this. Now Morgan, you might say, that's an awfully funny looking telescope. But of course, it's not a telescope. This is a flute. And you might be wondering to yourself, what does a flute have to do with a talk about astronomy and our understanding our place within the cosmos? And the answer is, is that this isn't just any old flute. This is a really, really old flute. What you're looking at here is the oldest musical instrument in the world. And it dates back more than 35,000 years to a period of time that we today call the Late Stone Age. And I have been fascinated by this instrument and others like it for a long time because I think it really indicates the level of mastery that our ancient ancestors had of the world around them. I can tell you one thing, and that's that if you dropped me off in the middle of the woods, I would be much more likely to be eaten by a bear than to walk out carrying something like this. And it's a lot more than just not getting eaten by a bear that our ancient ancestors tell us through an instrument like this. It's that they had uh, a complete understanding of the materials at their disposal in order to construct something this complicated, and that they had structured their societies such that they had the free time to quite literally invent music. And it's all the more impressive when you think about the fact that they made something like this whilst living in a place like this. This is a cave in Germany quite similar to the one in which that flute was found. And I have to imagine that 35,000 years ago, this cave didn't come standard with protective chain link fence and baby stroller. But even so, it looks like a pretty nice place to wait out a rainstorm. And so it's not difficult to envision that every night somebody from this group of people would take that flute and play it for everyone else. And all those other folks would sit at the front entrance of this cave and they'd look up at the night sky. And they'd watch the stars night after night, after night. And eventually, one individual, maybe brighter than the rest, but I'd like to think just a little bit more observant, began to notice a pattern. And they painted and carved and chiseled that pattern into the walls of their cave. It looked like this. What you're seeing here is the world's oldest calendar. Every one of these little marks represents one of the phases of the moon as it goes around our sun. We're seeing more than one month's worth of moon phases indicated here. And what this tells us is that our ancient ancestors, even 35,000 years ago, had already stumbled upon the most basic principle of science, that the universe is repeatable, that the universe is predictable. But you might also notice that this calendar isn't on the wall of a cave. It's on a small hunk of bone about the size of my hand. Because this isn't just the world's oldest calendar, it's also the world's oldest pocket calendar. And it shows how our ancestors didn't just want to make and understand this information. They wanted to take it with them when they move, and it's very similar to exactly what each one of us is probably doing and carrying in our pocket right now. And so on the broadest of scales, what this calendar and that musical instrument show us is that we were a curious, creative people even tens of thousands of years ago. And we weren't just curious and creative about the small world around us, we were obsessed with understanding what our place in the cosmos 
really is. And we can see that all over the world at all points through history. Take, for example, this guy. I think we probably all know and recognize Stonehenge, but maybe fewer of us realize that Stonehenge is actually just the most famous example of many hinges found across Britain, around Europe, and in North America. Some were made of stone, others wood, still others were just piles of earth arranged in particular ways. And these aren't randomly arranged gates of stone. They point the way towards specific astronomical events. Things like where the sun is in the sky on the longest and the shortest days of the year. We call those the solstices. And these guys weren't just idle curiosities to the people that built them. Archaeologists tell us that locations like Stonehenge were the places in which the most important functions of these societies took place. They went to the place that told them where they were in the universe in order to take care of their day-to-day -day business. And then sometimes they even built their day-to-day -day business around where they were in the universe. This is the Temple of Kukulkan in the present-day Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. It's a Maya temple. And the Maya built this so perfectly oriented that on two days every year, two very special days when the day and the night are of exactly equal length, rays of sun shine onto the edge of this temple, and the shadows cast the image of a serpent crawling down from the temple at the top. And if you don't believe me and say you're stretching the truth here, you can see the head of the serpent right here sticking out into the sunlight. And if on one of those special days you wanted to climb all the way up here to the temple at the top, you'd start at the bottom and climb 365 steps to reach the temple. The Maya had an extraordinary knowledge of the workings of the night sky, and they built many aspects of their life in accordance to it. But it wasn't just in our engineering that we showed our understanding of our position within the cosmos. It's also in our art. This is one of the most famous pieces of ancient artwork drawn on the wall of a cave at Lascaux. And for decades, we thought that paintings like this simply showed hunter and prey, perhaps cataloging the important achievements of those who painted them. But today we think differently. Today we think that at least some of these paintings may actually represent the constellations as they appeared more than 15,000 years ago when these were created. They weren't just recording the biggest, scariest animal that they had taken down. They were making a map of the night sky. And maps like this were incredibly important because unlike today where we can just open up our GPS, ancient people relied on the night sky to tell time, to plant their crops, and even to navigate. And so passing those down from generation to generation was of vital importance. And it's a remarkable fact that virtually every single culture on Earth noticed the same things about the night sky. They noticed when lunar and solar eclipses would happen, the equinoxes, the solstices. They recognized that two objects in the night sky were far, or in the sky were far different than any other, the sun and the moon. They shone incredibly brightly. And perhaps most remarkably of all, every culture on Earth recognized that in the night sky there were five objects different from all the others. Five things that seemed to meander across the night sky, and they could predict their comings and their goings. The Greeks called them the wanderers. We call them the planets. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, every single culture in history recognized and cataloged these objects. And 
To you and I, who have at best a passing familiarity with the night sky, this seems impossible, extraordinary. But it seems even more remarkable to realize that they picked these five objects out of a sky full of thousands of stars. Five objects out of thousands. And, you know, we rarely get an opportunity these days to see a truly dark sky. And even this evening, when you go up and visit the observatory, you might see a darker sky than you're used to, but it won't be a sky like in the darkest places on Earth. But if you were to journey to one of those places or manage to turn out all of the lights from our houses and businesses and cars, you could see about 5,000 stars from any given point on the Earth. 5,000 stars, and yet to pick out just five of them as special. And for thousands of years, this was the sum of our astronomical knowledge. We knew when the sun would rise and set, how the moon would move, where the planets would go. And it wouldn't really change until the year 1610, when a man named Galileo Galilei turned his first telescope to the stars and forever changed our relationship with the universe. And I have to admit that of all the figures in history, I might be most envious of Galileo, because I'm not sure there's a better, better example in the world of a time where you can clearly demarcate a before and an after. Because in one single night, Galileo fundamentally changed how we look at the universe. He took his telescope and he did the simplest possible things. First he pointed it at the moon and he made a very basic realization. The moon has mountains. Now this might seem like a relatively uninteresting thing to, to notice, but it flew in the face of 2,000 years of teaching handed down by Aristotle, who told us that the Earth was special, that every other object in the night sky was a perfect, flawless, immutable ball of crystal. And here comes Galileo, who says the, Earth has, or the moon has mountains, the moon has craters, the moon has valleys. Suddenly, the moon and the Earth seem a whole lot more similar than they did the night before. He then took his telescope and he pointed it at the Milky Way because he wanted to answer a question that had been puzzling astronomers for thousands of years. What was that strange white substance painted across the night sky? And what he discovered astonished him. Everywhere he looked, every single inch of the Milky Way was filled with nothing but thousands and thousands of stars. And I want to take a brief aside and say that if you haven't read Galileo's original book describing these things, then I highly encourage it. It's only about 50 pages, and he talks about seeing the moon for the first time, discovering the stars in the Milky Way, and discovering the moons of Jupiter. And Galileo may well be the very first modern science communicator, because unlike all his academic peers, he didn't write his book in Latin. He wrote it in his native tongue of Italian, knowing that many of his colleagues may never read it, but he wanted to ensure that the public were the first to know of the wonders that he discovered in the night sky. And what Galileo had done was show us just the tip of an iceberg that we now know stretches across more than 200 billion stars in our Milky Way. 200 billion stars. And to think that we were only seeing a few thousand for most of human history. This was such a great revelation that astronomers have spent the last 400 years more or less just searching out and cataloging and studying and naming all the things that Galileo originally uncovered. And along the way, we've learned a lot about the universe and our place within it. It didn't take long for us to realize that, hey, the Earth is not the center of the universe. It's not even the center of our own solar system. And the sun, the sun isn't the center of our galaxy. And as we piled up these stars, thousands after thousands, we started to realize that the sun was actually just a pretty average, pretty mediocre 
star. Out there in the Milky Way, you can find billions of stars that are bigger and brighter and hotter than the sun. And you can find even more billions that are smaller and dimmer and cooler. And so around the middle of the 20th century, we started to realize that, hey, if the Earth isn't special and the sun isn't special, then shouldn't the sun not be the only star out there that had planets? Why would our star have eight planets and no other star would have a single one? And so we began to look for them. And 20 years ago this year, in 1995, we found the first planet around another normal star. And since then, we've started to discover them by the boatload. And that's been greatly aided by the launch in 2010 of an instrument called the Kepler Space Telescope. And what Kepler did was simply stare. Hour after hour, month after month, year after year, Kepler orbits the Earth and stares at the same patch of sky. And it measures the brightness of every star it can see, hundreds of thousands of stars. And once in a while, it happens to catch a star that just momentarily seems to get dimmer. And then somewhere else, another one. And then somewhere else, another one. And over the years, astronomers can track which stars seem to get dimmer again and again and again. And when that happens, they know they've caught a planet red-handed. Because as that planet orbits around its star, back and forth and back and forth, every time it goes around, it will pass between the star and the Earth. <laughs> and it dims it out just a little bit. And using this technique, Kepler has helped us find more than 4,000 possible planets. But just in the tiniest patch of sky. You can see a couple of things in this artist's conception here. First, that I wasn't lying to you. Here's our sun. It's not at the middle of the galaxy. But you can also see the area in which the Kepler Space Telescope is looking. It's just a tiny patch of sky. And if we take that tiny patch and we smear it out across the entire galaxy, what we find is that there's 100 billion planets out there in our Milky Way. 100 billion planets around 200 billion stars. That means that if you go out anywhere in the galaxy and you grab two stars, on average, one of them is going to have a planet. And this has led us to finding an unending supply of truly remarkable worlds. We found planets orbiting two stars. We call those the Tatooines. We found planets in three star systems, in four star systems, in five star systems. We found planets that go around backwards in their orbit. We found planets larger than Jupiter, the largest planet in our own solar system, orbiting 10 times closer to their star than Mercury does to our sun. But most remarkably of all, we now think that 10% of those planets, 10 billion worlds, are likely Earth-like planets orbiting sun-like stars at or near the so-called habitable zone. And now that we have thousands of these planets, we've started to think, well, what could these habitable planets be like? What would they look like if we motored up in our spaceship and took a look? And we only have one way to find out, and that's to study the most remarkable planet we've ever discovered, our own. It's no accident that there's one field of science dedicated to studying the entire universe and many more dedicated to studying just one single planet. The Earth is fantastically, wondrously complex, full of so much plant and animal life that we haven't even begun to catalog and name it all. And even so, we can still look and find some truly incredible examples of life. Take, for example, the animals that are so-called bioluminescent. They create their own light from the fireflies in our backyard in a nice warm summer afternoon to the kind of creepy anglerfish floating miles beneath the ocean and fishing with a light hanging off the end 
of its body. These animals can create light far more efficiently than any method we have developed in our laboratories. More efficient than light bulbs, more efficient than LEDs. Anglerfish is where it's at. We also have discovered so many kinds of trees covering such a large part of the earth that in the northern hemisphere, when summer turns to fall and the leaves began to die and fall off of the branches, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere of the earth changes <laughs> until spring rolls around once more. Perhaps the most remarkable fact is that we have yet to find a habitat here on Earth in which life doesn't thrive. From the hottest underwater vents to the coldest undersea or under ice lakes in Antarctica, we see plants and animals who make those places their home. But of course, there's one kind of life that at least to me, is far more interesting than any other. And that's ourselves. In the grand scheme of the history of the Earth and the life of the universe, we've been around for the briefest flash in the pan. And yet we've accomplished so much. I find it remarkable to realize that fewer human beings have ever lived than there are stars out there in our Milky Way galaxy. And in fact, if you were to go up to the observatory tonight, and take one of those telescopes and point it at our closest galactic neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, the light that would come in the observatory through the telescope and hit the back of your eye, when that left Andromeda, human beings were not even a species. So given the fantastic life that we see on our own planet, what can we imagine that we would find out there in the universe? And I think the first question that we need to be able to answer is, what does it mean to be alive? And that seems like one of those simple questions that you'd learn in school or that you could ask Siri and you just get back the answer. Life is this. But it turns out that life is such a remarkably complicated thing that even after hundreds of years of working, biologists still don't have a single definition of what it means to be alive. Instead, we have a list of traits that life seems to have. Things like growing, adapting to your surroundings, evolving over time, affecting the world both within you and without you, and ultimately reproducing. Because it's ironic that perhaps the single best definition of being alive is that something can die. And even with this list of things, we have difficulty classifying life here on Earth. If you have a, sub or a specimen and it meets all of these things, and you can call it alive, kind of, sort of, but inside of each one of us right now is an uncountable number of viruses. And viruses, change our bodies, they invade our cells, they can affect our DNA, replicate themselves, burst forth, and reproduce. But you take those cells away, and the virus will die. There's no way for two viruses to make a third. And yet they have such tremendous effect on the world, both within us and around us. So are viruses alive? Scientists can't agree. And if we can't even agree on whether things are alive within our own bodies, how likely, are, how, how likely are we to be able to make that sort of assertion from a faraway world? Instead, we've restricted ourselves to trying to understand what life needs to survive. Because then we understand where we need to go when we finally understand what life is actually like. And it turns out the list of things that life needs to survive is quite a bit simpler than the list of what life could be. It's made up of basically these three things. As far as we can tell, all life on Earth is made of carbon. It's a very simple atom. If you've ever heard the terms organic molecule or organic this or organic that, all they're saying is it's full of carbon. 
We also think that all life on Earth needs liquid water. We've yet to find a species living anywhere on Earth, even in the driest deserts, that doesn't use liquid water to survive. And then finally, all life seems to need energy. For me, that's a bowl of Wheaties in the morning. But if you're an extremophile bacteria, that could be the heat from a volcano coming up from far beneath the surface of the Earth. And I call this talk Star Stuff because every one of these things can be found coming from a star. And I like to think of our Milky Way galaxy as not just a galaxy of 200 billion stars, but 200 billion furnaces for creating the ingredients for life. So now that we know what life <laughs> could use, where should we go to look for it? Well, in our solar system, we have a couple of good possibilities, and neither of them is named Mars. Maybe the best place to look for life in our solar system is out at Saturn. Uh, here you can see that the most common elements in the universe are also the most common elements inside our bodies. We're quite literally made of the simplest stuff in the universe. There's Saturn. Saturn was the farthest away of the planets known to our ancient ancestors. Here's a beautiful picture of it, taken by NASA's Cassini spacecraft, which has now been in orbit about Saturn for more than 11 years. In this image, the sun is directly behind Saturn, catch, or casting the disk of the planet into a dark shadow. But that light can filter through the rings and light them up beautifully for us. And if you go out to the observatory or bring out your home telescope, these are the rings you can see yourself. We have the A ring, the B ring, separated here by the Cassini division, it's the classical ring system of Saturn. But you might notice way out here, there's a really thin, really faint ring. This is called the E-ring, and it's so tenuous that it actually wasn't discovered until we went to Saturn in the late 1970s. It's so tenuous that if the E-ring were inside of this auditorium right now, we could breathe it in and out, and we wouldn't even know that it was there. And because it's so thin, astronomers were astonished to discover it, because this ring should drift away to space after only a couple hundred years. And yet here we are, four and a half billion years into the history of the solar system, and the E-ring is still kicking. In 2006, the Cassini spacecraft finally gave us the answer, an amazing moon called Enceladus. And at the bottom of Enceladus are four long cracks across the surface. Astronomers call them the tiger stripes. And out of each one of those cracks blasts a series of geysers, shooting nearly pure water thousands of miles out into space and forming an entire beautiful ring of Saturn. And this water can exist at Enceladus, even though it's hundreds of degrees colder than the coldest place on Earth, for a reason that we're very familiar with, the tides. Just like here on Earth, where the gravity of the moon lifts up the ocean and then lets it go back down, creating our high tides and our low tides, Saturn, far, far more massive than our moon, actually lifts up the surface of Enceladus and lets it fall back down. You can imagine that if you lift up ice and rock back and forth, back and forth, it's like rubbing your hands together. If you rub your hands together fast enough, it gets hot. And there's enough heat inside of Enceladus here in order to maintain an ocean of salty but liquid water. And that so-called tidal energy could also provide the energy needed for life to survive. So we've got water, we've got energy. Deep inside of Enceladus, at the bottom of the ocean, we believe there may be a rocky core, and rocks are full of carbon. And so here we have the three necessary ingredients for life, carbon, water, energy. If we want to look for life, Enceladus is the place to go. 
But I want to return to this picture. Because I started off our journey this afternoon by talking about how obsessed our ancient ancestors were with their place in the cosmos. And that obsession has continued right up until the modern day, because we didn't just take this picture so that we could see a beautiful image of Saturn's rings. We took it so we could see ourselves. Those few points of light right there, that's us. That's home. And this wasn't an accident. We had traveled billions of miles out to Saturn, and we wanted to make sure that we took a picture that showed us where we'd come from. And just like with Galileo, we also have continued to push the boundaries of what we know and try to understand how big and how amazing our universe is. Just like when Galileo first pointed his telescope at the Milky Way and discovered that it was full of stars, we've taken our most powerful telescopes and used them to reveal an entire unseen universe. Back in 2004, astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope, one of our most powerful scientific instruments, created this image by taking Hubble and staring it at a patch of sky that appeared completely empty. No stars, no planets, no galaxies. They stared for 17 days with Hubble at this completely blank patch of sky. And when they were done, this is what they saw. Thousands of galaxies. Every point of light in this image is an entire galaxy. And just like with Kepler, we can take that and smear it across the entire night sky. And what we find is that our observable universe, just the part that we can see, is filled with 200 billion galaxies. And now that we're pretty comfortable with thinking that, hey, everything about us is pretty average, we can guess that each of those 200 billion galaxies might itself have 200 billion stars and 100 billion planets. And it's because of images like this that if you walk up to an astronomer and ask them, is there life in the universe, they will tell you yes. Because the numbers that we encounter when we think about the universe are so vast as to be almost meaningless. What could the possibility be of life in the universe? Do you think that maybe one in a million chance that in any given star at any given time life arise? Maybe one in a billion or one in a million is too uh, generous. Maybe it's one in a billion. One of every billion stars out there in the Milky Way, that has life. But we can cover all of our bases. What if we ask about one in every million billion planets? What if that's the odds of life created or forming? Then we'd still have 40 million worlds in the universe that had life. 40 million possibilities to see a species like our own. And this is, in a sense, where we have to kind of turn it over to the science fiction writers and the movie makers and the downers out there. Because the truth is, there might be 40 billion or 40 million worlds with life in the universe, but the same things that allow us to know that life is probably out there are the forces that make it unlikely that we'll ever encounter it. The universe is impossibly, unimaginably, teeth-chatteringly large, and we have made such a tiny little splash in that enormous ocean. It's been about a hundred years that we've been communicating to one another using radio waves. You listen to a baseball game on the radio, you watch a football game on TV. Some of that signal reaches your house or your car or your iPhone, but some of the rest of it goes out into space. And that 
radio travels at the speed of light. And so in the last hundred years, we have put signals out to the universe that reach out about a hundred light years. But that's just close enough to reach the first few stars in a galaxy of 200 billion. Not even near the edge of our galaxy, and then millions of years for that light to reach the next galaxy. That hasn't stopped us from listening. We've been listening for the signals of other life for decades now, and we've yet to hear a single thing. But if we do, and I sincerely hope that one day we do, we're still probably not going to be able to pop in our rocket ship and go out to visit it. Because even if we could travel at the fastest anything we have ever made has traveled, it would still take us nearly 80,000 years to reach the closest star. And Voyager 1, it's not even going in the right direction. And so the universe may be vast, but that doesn't mean that we should stop dreaming big and thinking big and working to figure out how we can go there and what we're going to do when we finally arrive. Because as the, as the future namesake of a telescope once told the discoverer of the universe, if you pick a destination, we'll go there. Thank you.